Okay, our next speaker is Colin Wormsley. Colin is a state entomologist for the Missouri Department of Agriculture. And Colin has been with the Missouri Department of Agriculture's Plant Pest Control Bureau since 2000, serving as a state entomologist and bureau manager since 2007. Colin is a Missouri native, having grown up on a sixth generation Missouri farm in the Mississippi River Hills of Pike County. Colin earned a bachelor's and a master's degree from Northwest Missouri State University in agronomy and entomology. The Office of the State Entomologist was established in 1868 and is responsible for preventing the introduction and spread of exotic plant pests into Missouri. Today, Colin is going to give us some pest updates. So, Ms. Colin. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's kind of hard to follow a talk like uh, Mr. Brannigan's because he's looking at all these beautiful plants and uh, my time is going to be spent on kind of the dark underbelly of the plant world, <laughs> the invasive pests. So I'm going to talk about a few things this morning. i um, going to cover some of the uh, invasive pests that we deal with at the Missouri Department of Agriculture and, and that are threats to Kansas as well. Uh, emerald ash borer, I'll probably spend most of the time on that. Um, Asian longhorn beetle, um, I think it was mentioned this morning uh, about maples. Uh, preferred host is maple uh, for the Asian longhorn beetle, so that's something we're looking for in Missouri. Uh, thousand cankers disease of walnut, a hugely important tree for uh, the Midwest, both uh, economically and also in the environment and as a food source for uh, our animals. But then I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about a couple of rose diseases if there's time there and uh, brown marmorated stink bug, uh, something to start looking for in the Kansas City area. I did want to mention um, that we are uh, probably going to be posting a job uh, for a summer position uh, in the Kansas City area um, for this summer for our gypsy moth survey. So if you live on the um, Missouri side of the state line in the Kansas City metro, uh, check out our webpage, agriculture.missouri.gov. Um, it's a lot of driving. You get to see a, a lot of parts of the state that you normally wouldn't um, in helping protect our, our forests. Um, so the reason that you know, I like doing what I do is, uh, as Laika mentioned, uh, I grew up on a, on a farm in Missouri that uh, has been in our family for about 150 years uh, and, and uh, want to do everything that we can to protect um, not just the agriculture there, but also the forests. Missouri has about 16 million acres of forest land, uh, oak hickory forest, but also those beautiful black walnut trees and, and other species that we want to protect. So emerald ash borer, I uh, just wanted to go through the signs and symptoms. Um, I'm sure you all have heard of emerald ash borer. It is in the Kansas City metro area. But knowing the signs and symptoms, you all can really help out. Um, you know, we're still surveying for it, both in Missouri and Kansas. Uh, there's only a few counties in, in Kansas where it's been detected. So we're continuing to survey. Um, we want to know where it's at so we can help homeowners and landowners and cities uh, make management decisions uh, if it's in their area. So a couple of things you can look for here is this uh, little D-shaped exit hole. That's about an eighth of an inch wide. It's really honestly not very noticeable on the trunk of a, of a rough barked uh, older ash tree, but if you take a pocket knife and kind of peel it down just a little bit, if you see an exit hole, look for that capital D-shaped uh, exit hole. And then these serpentine galleries, if you see that on, a, on an ash tree, that's really unique to the emerald ash borer, so another, another good sign to look for. Uh, thinning canopy. The emerald ash borer likes to go to the top of the canopy when it first uh, infests a tree and then it kind of works its way down with each generation. So um, if you see a thinning canopy, then you want to go up and start looking closer at that tree. Um, of course, a, a stress response for, for any tree um, is, is starting to push out these epicormic sprouts. So if you're noticing that in some of the larger branches in the canopy or down on the main trunk, uh, you want to look for that. Uh, look for some of these other signs and symptoms. Woodpecker damage is really a great thing to look for. Um, we've got some areas in Kansas City, particularly up in Platte County, where the populations are starting to build up of emerald ash borer. Woodpeckers love these things, so if you're seeing excessive woodpecker damage, uh, really kind of cue in on that. They, they like to kind of chip that bark away on the surface of the tree to get down to where the larvae are, so it kind of has this blonding effect on the surface of the tree. Another good thing to look for is uh, bark splits. So when the, the larvae are uh, making their galleries under the bark, uh, a year or two uh, later, that, that tissue around that gallery kind of calluses off and the bark will split over top. 
So if you see these uh, bark splits in the, in the main uh, trunk or in the larger branches, uh, look under there, peel that bark back and look for those serpentine galleries. Uh, so some of the survey methods that we use, uh, and honestly I'll, I'll say that these aren't terribly effective survey methods. Uh, a lot of the new populations that are found are, are from just uh, observant arborists or homeowners or city foresters uh, that are looking closely at their trees. Um, but we do uh, formal surveys for emerald ash borer also. One of the newer traps that we use is a green uh, Lindgren funnel trap. It's got a, a bait in there that uh, to the emerald ash borer smells like a, a stressed ash tree. Uh, and also the green color is very attractive to it. But these are pretty high maintenance traps. We've got to go out and check them every couple of weeks. Uh, the main survey tool that we use is this big purple sticky uh, trap that has the same lure on it. Um, and we just put those out in the field and we'll leave them for a couple of months and come back and check them uh, for the little uh, emerald ash borer adults. Another labor intensive method that's used, um, but it is pretty effective, is just girdling an ash tree. Of course, you're not going to do this so much in the urban landscape, but um, some of the the publicly held lands like um, state forests um, and so forth will use this detection method. So they girdle the tree, uh, the tree is, is dying, so it's pushing out all of these chemical cues to the beetles that are very attractive to them. And then we'll come back in that winter and cut the tree down and uh, peel the tree, just peel every square inch of it looking for, um, for the larva of the emerald ash borer. And uh, this is a new technique that's being researched. I don't know how effective it is, um, so anyway. <laughs> I don't know if you want to try that one. So we've been surveying a lot in Missouri. Um, we're really concentrating on the urban areas of the state because largely this is an urban pest, um, particularly for cities and for homeowners. Um, cities that have lots of ash trees planted out that they're responsible for taking care of planted along our sidewalks or in our parks. As these things die, as they're infested, they become hazard trees. Um, so it's really a, a, an urban issue, largely. So we're surveying St. Louis, Kansas City, um, Columbia, Jeff City, Springfield. This is all the survey we did last year. Uh, but we're also looking at uh, some other areas of the state and the rural areas where there's pathways, like campgrounds, um, wood products facilities, like uh, mills and so forth. Uh, we had several new detections last year. Uh, the closest one to this area was in um, Buchanan County, St. Joseph. Uh, that was using the purple traps. Um, and also down here in Oregon County, really out um, in a rural part of the state, um, using the purple trap. In St. Louis, St. Louis City and St. Louis County, both of those instances were arborists, um, actually tree trimming companies that are uh, hired out by the utility companies to clear lines. Uh, noticed the, the signs of emerald ash borer and contacted our state forestry agency. And then Hannibal, um, America's hometown, Mark Twain's home, uh, we found it there last year. Um, their golf course superintendent had been attending a, a field day for University of Missouri and heard folks talking about emerald ash borer and went back to the golf course, noticed the signs of emerald ash borer and reported it. So right now we have, uh, I think, about 15 counties that are known to be infested in the state, but we suspect that there's many more. Again, it's just a really hard pest to, to detect. Um, nationwide, uh, it's about 25 states now. It's first detected in 2002 in, in Detroit, Michigan, but now it's spread to, to 25 states. Um, and it's a big resource at risk. Uh, out in our native forest, at least in Missouri, it's only about 3% of our trees are ash, but in the urban landscapes, um, it's anywhere from, I think on average, about 14%, but in some neighborhoods and parks and so forth, it's 30% it's or greater. Uh, the St. Louis Arch recently, um, about 39% of the trees on the arch grounds were ash, and uh, we haven't detected it there yet, but they're in the process of removing ash trees there at the, the arch grounds and replacing it with another, uh, another tree species. Just preparing for the threat of emerald ash borer. Uh, so we do want you to report uh, new county detections. Again, this is very helpful to homeowners and cities to make management decisions. Um, so you can tell what counties are known to be infested 
If you go to eab.missouri.edu for Missouri, and folks in Kansas, you can go to the Kansas Department of Agriculture website. Uh, they keep that updated. Um, you can call uh, my office at the Missouri Department of Ag, or the Missouri Department of Conservation has a toll-free number that you can call and report that to, or you can do it online at eab.missouri.edu. And again, uh, in Kansas, the Kansas Department of Ag, or the Kansas Forest Service, or uh, K-State Extension, uh, you can call those folks. Just real quickly on uh, regulatory, um, there are implications. There's a, a federal quarantine for emerald ash borer. Um, that's expanded greatly the last few years, but um, basically you can move regulated articles of emerald ash borer anywhere in this big yellow area because it's, it's largely infested there. You just can't cross over those red lines into the, into the white area. So regulated articles would be ash nursery stock, um, ash logs and lumber. If you're in the tree uh, trimming business, uh, it'd be you know, ash tree debris ash chips and so forth, but also uh, all hardwood firewood. And so I think that kind of impacts everybody. If you go camping, a lot of people bring their own firewood with them. This is really the pathway that a lot of these invasive forest pests are getting moved around the country is in infested firewood. You know, you've got a tree that's sick and dying, you cut it down, you cut it up into firewood, you don't really know why it died, but um, in the case with ash, that's largely um, how emerald ash borers moved around was a lot of dead and dying trees up in, uh, you know, Michigan, Indiana, and Ohio, and people cutting them down and taking them with them on camping trips, not knowing that emerald ash borer was in that wood and was going to emerge uh, when they got to their destination. So just looking at the Kansas City metro area here, um, you can cross the state line uh, if you're staying within these yellow areas, but again, can't cross over those those red lines into the, into the white area. So if you're in Overland Park and you wanna take some firewood to your family in Manhattan, Kansas, can't do that. Um, so just be aware of the quarantines and those are, those are ever changing. So again, you can go to eab.missouri.edu for more information. One of the things we're doing, uh, actually outreach is probably the most important thing we're doing, just letting people know about what to look for and what the pathways for movement are. Uh, but one of the things we have is uh, some biocontrol agents uh, that have been uh, tested by the U.S. Forest Service and uh, USDA Plant Protection and Quarantine. They have a rearing facility in Brighton, Michigan, and, and we've benefited from being able to get these biocontrol agents from them. And we've done several releases around the state. But there's three of them that we're using. One of them attacks the egg of the emerald ash borer and the other two attack uh, the larval stage. And they just lay their eggs inside of them and the the uh, little wasps develop and emerge and kills the, the emerald ash borer. So these are all the release sites in the United States. Uh, we've done them in St. Louis, Kansas City, uh, down here in Pulaski County, if you're familiar with uh, Fort Leonard Wood on I-44. Uh, there's a town there, Waynesville, where we've done releases. And then our original detection site down in Wayne County, uh, which was on Army Corps of Engineers land, we've done several releases there back as far as 2012. Uh, we haven't noticed uh, establishment in Missouri of the parasitoids yet, but several of these other states have. Generally takes about three to four years to, to determine if they've established or not. And so we've, it's been almost four years since we did our first release. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through this in any great detail, but just wanted to point out that there's a, an emerald ash borer management guide for homeowners, and I've got that at our booth uh, downstairs, but it's a really great resource uh, for homeowners. Or if you're in, uh, you know, the lawn care business or uh, greenhouse or nursery, it's a great resource to hand out to your customers. Um, so it, it kind of takes you through a decision-making process of, okay, emerald ash borers in the area. I have ash trees in my yard. What do I do now? Do I cut them down? Do I invest in treatment? It just helps you go through that decision-making process. Um, Asian longhorn beetle. There's another one. We don't have it in Missouri or Kansas. The closest location is um, Ohio, but it's something to keep, uh, keep a lookout for. It's got a pretty wide host range, but uh, maples are its preferred host. Um, it's just a huge uh, longhorn beetle, um, and it, it bores into the tree and just does a lot of damage. Um, the emerald ash borer just bores under the bark, but this one bores right through into the hardwood and causes a lot of structural damage to the tree. 
Um, so things to look for, there's a couple of different signs here on this picture. Uh, this is the egg niche where the female beetle chews into the bark a little bit and cuts a little slit and then lays the egg inside of that and then kind of covers it up with a little waxy coating. Um, so that's one thing to look for. Whoops. And then uh, the other thing to look for are these giant exit holes. And I know you can't really tell scale from there, that, but if you took a, a number two pencil and put it into that exit hole, you'd still have just enough room to wiggle that pencil around a little bit. So it's a pretty big hole. Uh, these are the locations in the United States where it's been found. Uh, the nearest one was Chicago, but uh, it was successfully eradicated. Uh, this is one of the few forest pests where there's been some success stories with eradication once it's become established in an area. Um, the current closest location to Kansas City is uh, here in southern Ohio, um, but there's locations in uh, Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, New York, New Jersey, and up here in Ontario. Uh, thousand cankers disease, this is a really important pest uh, threat to Missouri. Um, we've got a lot of black walnut trees. Uh, it's estimated we've got about uh, 55 million uh, black walnut trees in Missouri, and that doesn't include uh, in urban areas or in black walnut plantations or managed stands. Um, so it's a, it's a huge resource. It's a big business for the state. Uh, it's a very valuable timber species, but also we have a, a black walnut uh, processing uh, company in Stockton, Missouri, uh, Hammond's Products. It's a third generation family business. It's the world's largest black walnut processor, and they ship their walnuts all over the world. Um, so it's, it's a beetle and a fungus, and the beetle carries the, uh, the fungal spores on its body, and so when it goes to another tree and bores into the tree, it inoculates that fungus, and then that fungus grows and causes these little cankers. Uh, the problem is, is that the beetles build up in huge populations, just thousands and thousands in a single tree, and so you've got lots of these cankers in a tree, hence the name thousand cankers disease. Um, so you can see the brown beetles here are covered in these white fungal spores, um, and then they emerge from the tree and, and spread it to another tree. Symptoms to look for, and please, if you see black walnut trees with any of these symptoms, if you would contact Missouri Department of Agriculture or Kansas Department of Agriculture if you're in Kansas and report it. Uh, this is something we're looking really closely for. So if you look for, uh, you know, you've got a nice big green canopy in the middle of the summer, and you've got a little bit of yellow flagging, there's lots of things that'll cause that, but uh, that's a symptom to look for. Uh, as the, as the population of the beetles and the disease progresses, you'll get more branch dieback. Uh, in midsummer, you'll see brown leaves clinging onto dead branches, uh, and then eventually you get more branch dieback. It's kind of a slow-moving disease. It might take uh, up to eight years um, for first symptoms to be noticed, but then once you start seeing these symptoms, it's maybe two to three years before the tree is dead. These are all the states where it's been detected. Um, the funny thing about this is that the beetle and the fungus both are native to the United States, um, you know, basically to southwestern United States and northern Mexico. Uh, kind of coexisted with um, Arizona walnuts down there. Not, a, not really a pest species to that uh, walnut. Um, but where black walnuts had been planted out in the west, um, where they're not native, um, the, the disease um, came across the trees and, and started causing a lot of mortality. Um, noted probably back as far back as um, the early 1990s. But in 2010, it was discovered in the, the native range of black walnut out in the east in Knoxville, Tennessee. And since then, it's been detected in several, several states out here. So again, having it in the native range of eastern black walnut is, a, is just a big economic threat, um, but also you know, this is a mast species that provides a lot of food source to our, to our wildlife. Um, so again, this is a big, big threat. And Missouri and Kansas, too, being big walnut producers, uh, we want to look very closely for this. Um, I'm going to go through this real quick, but a couple of diseases of roses that are kind of emerging over the last several years. Um, these aren't diseases of uh, regulatory concern, I guess, um, where we would have quarantines or anything, but certainly they cause a lot of damage and you want to be aware of them. I think the thing that's kind of newer about this is that um, uh, we're seeing it in knockout roses and, you know, those were thought to be really disease resistant roses and they're still really nice and these things can be controlled to an extent, but you just want to 
know a little bit about them and how to look for it and how to treat. Uh, so the first one is downy mildew. It's a fungal disease. Uh, and then the other one I'll talk about real quick is rose rosette disease. It's a virus. Uh, so downy mildew, um, it causes these purplish, blocky, red lesions uh, on the leaves. Uh, if you look, look on the underside of those leaves where those lesions are, you'll see kind of a white downy growth. Um, and it can also cause stem cankers. Uh, so what we're looking for, again, is just these purplish, red, kind of blocky lesions uh, and stem cankers. Um, some things you can do, obviously, purchase clean stock, talk to your supplier um, about, you know, how they, how they scout for these diseases or how they control them in the nurseries and what their sources are. Um, a big thing with any fungal disease is just improving air circulation. You can do that by pruning or planting spaces. Um, and then another thing is just uh, overhead irrigation. You want to reduce the, uh, the leaf wetness, um, which really uh, leaf wetness promotes the growth of these fungal pathogens. Um, you can use preventative fungicide treatments. Uh, those can be successful. Um, but sanitation is another big thing, just you know, keeping the lead debris up off the ground, uh, especially through the winter, um, pruning out those effect infected areas. And then rose rosette disease. Um, if you're familiar with multiple rose, uh, kind of a, an invasive weed species uh, in the United States, um, rose rosette disease uh, is really common on that plant. Um, and what you want to look for is uh, kind of this elongate, abnormal growth, kind of darker red coloring, a lot more uh, uh, thorniness on the stems. Um, and then you can see some more up here on, on this photo, just that kind of odd uh, witch's brooming uh, in the growth pattern in, in dark red. It's, uh, it's a virus that's spread by a tiny little eryophyid mite. Um, so uh, it's, it's uh, vectored either through grafting uh, from, from infected plant material or, or from movement of the eryophyid mite. Um, some things that you can do, uh, probably an important thing is removing any, any multiflora rows in the area, and you can work with your neighbors on that too, um, trying to remove that. Uh, if you're kind of out on the edge of the city or out in rural areas, you know, it grows in fence rows uh, and so forth. Um, you want to remove infected plant material in your yard, so if you've got uh, roses that are, that are infected, you want to remove those uh, to protect your other, other plants. And... Uh, you know, when you're doing just routine pruning, just pruning out those infected areas uh, and, and disinfecting your pruners uh, between each plant so you don't spread it that way. Um, and then lastly, if I've got a few minutes, uh, brown marmorated stink bug. Um, I don't, I think there's been some detections in the Kansas City metro, um, haven't heard too much about it. We've, we've got some areas in the St. Louis area that are, that are um, where it's becoming established. Um, it was introduced into uh, Pennsylvania in 1998, uh, and this kind of has a, uh, multiple problems with it. Uh, first of all, it's a plant pest. It attacks a lot of food and, and field crops, um, but it also invades your home. So you know the lady beetles that get into your home in the fall and congregate and just kind of are a nuisance and they stink and everything. Well, these have that same characteristic where they build up in your home in really big numbers and they stink really bad. And, um, and they, they're in big numbers and hard to control. Um, so multiple problems with this one. Uh, it attacks a lot of fruits, a lot of our uh, fruit-bearing trees, uh, vegetable and field crops from soybeans to corn to tomatoes. Uh, and it's also an ornamental pest to a degree. Um, there's some good identification guides for this to help uh, identify. We have a lot of native stink, stink bugs uh, in Missouri and Kansas, and some of them look kind of similar, but knowing what this one looks like um, will help you. Uh, so there's some good guides. I've got some of those down at our booth downstairs, but uh, some of the things to look for, I think I've got another picture here later. Um, these are the areas in the United States where it's been detected. Out here in the red areas, it's not only a nuisance pest at this point, but it's also causing a lot of economic damage on our crops. Um, Missouri, and this is basically from the St. Louis area, is, it's a nuisance pest right now. Uh, one of the things to look for to distinguish it from other stink bugs is the white banding on the antenna, and to some degree on the legs as well. Uh, but then also it's got these kind of uh, brown and white patterns on, on the edge of the, of the elytra right out here. 
some of the fruit damage uh, that it causes really extensive compared to other, other stink bugs. These are the locations we've confirmed in Missouri. Um, in Kansas, uh, it's been detected in Johnson and Shawnee counties, but I don't, it's not known to be established there yet. Um, we've had some other detections in Missouri that we're working on confirming, kind of up in northeastern Missouri right here, and then down in Jefferson County, south of St. Louis. Um, so I think that's about it. Um, got some contact information here. Again, um, you know, just be alert and know your plant species. Um, know what's normal, so then you'll know what looks abnormal, and you can find some of these problems. And for these invasive pests, please just report them to uh, Missouri Department of Ag or Kansas Department of Ag. We'd really appreciate it. So, thanks.